Introduction to Advanced Bible Interpretation My name is Matthew Vashaw. I'm from BibleProtector.com Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 11 and 12 says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. That's an indictment on today's Christianity. Because there's many Christians today that are either saying the Bible is sealed and cannot be understood, or they're saying, I haven't been to Bible college, I can't understand it. No. How do you read the Bible? How do you read the book of Isaiah, for example? Well, you don't read it unbelievingly, like you don't say, well, there's many Isaiahs and it's a purely human book written after the events. Now we're talking about a believing approach. But this is how most believers approach the book of Isaiah. They say it's a largely historical book, as in written in Isaiah's own times about the lead up to the Assyrians, prophecy, and the time of Hezekiah's latter reign, which is prophecy as well. And they say, this is a, I guess, what we'll call a believing evangelical view, that some prophecies are about the time of the Messiah, and there's a few millennial prophecies and some applications to, well, broadly, applications to Christian living. And maybe, as some Pentecostals and Charismatics do, they find some other prophetic elements in there, for example, about King Cyrus. I have to say that the above approach is unsatisfactory or simplistic, as it tends to leave a lot of the book's content sort of pointless. And that's the real problem that Christians have is, oh yes, I know about you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but really, like there's a lot of things in Isaiah that they don't look at, they don't regard. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The Bible is pointing to us this idea that what is written in the Old Testament is entirely relevant to us today. Here are some principles for advanced understanding. The King James Bible, pure Cambridge edition, should be taken as is to the word, letter, and punctuation mark as exactly true. In other words, that is our basis of interpreting Scripture. We should believe that the Holy Ghost actually does guide into all truth. In other words, we can actually understand Scripture and all parts of it. There's no parts really irrelevant. The Bible is written with a conceptual structure. For example, in the case of Isaiah, not merely some simplistic 39 chapters equals the Old Testament and chapters 40 to chapter 66 equals the New Testament type of approach that some people have, but rather a more detailed conceptual structure. The scripture is capable of multiple proper interpretations. Prophetic scripture should be taken at least both with a literal and a spiritual meaning. So in other words, scripture is not just merely... Um, we'll say monological. It's not just one idea by itself and alone. That's it. God declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Therefore, scripture has a prophetic present relevance. In other words, if God is speaking, then he's really speaking now to us. And therefore, the New Testament reader is in a position of actually having all relevance of what is written as being accessible to them. And that is us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 9 and 10 says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God care for oxen? Paul asks. Or saith he it all together for our sakes? What, the law of Moses wasn't written for the Israelites in the wilderness? 
that's what Paul's saying. He's saying really scripture wasn't merely written for them in a natural sense, but rather was written for us in a spiritual sense. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that thresheth um, in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now, he was using this to say that ministry and ministry work should be rewarded. And we see then that what's really there in the Old Testament in a you know, literal agricultural and husbandry sense um, is only like just a natural meaning. And yes, there's a principle of truth. Obviously, God does care for oxen in a sense. However, so much more does he care for his gospel preachers. Um, therefore, far above oxen are we. And this is really a wonderful promise of scripture that whatever is written there, and we read it before, but whatsoever is written there aforetime, what's, what's in the Old Testament really is relevant and written for us, for our sakes, is written to us, for us. That's why the word of God is coming more and more throughout the world. That's why technology exists to bring the scripture more and more throughout the world today. And this is a vital doctrine because it's not relegating the Bible to merely oh, that was relevant to the Israelites and not to us. So the book of Daniel, and I'll just use Daniel because we're really going to be talking about Isaiah as our example, but the book of Daniel clearly delineates between a Western Antichrist and an Eastern Antichrist. Uh, you can see a Western Antichrist, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, it says a little horn, but in Daniel chapter 8, you see another kind of little horn, and that's the Eastern Antichrist. And it also shows the iterations of fulfillments, for example, a first fulfillment, like a preterist fulfillment, a historicist or a, a long-term historical fulfillment, and a futurist or a, or a ultimate fulfillment. Daniel Unsealed helps interpret Isaiah. Well, once you know sort of this methodology, then when you look at the book of Isaiah, you can understand it's not just prophecies of Isaiah talking about the Assyrians are coming, Isaiah talking about there's going to be a time of blessing under Hezekiah, no, much more than that. It clearly is something that is relevant to the future of the world. What scripture are we basing that off? Well, I can tell you right now. It's in Acts chapter 3, and it says that essentially all those things that were prophesied by the prophets are really talking about the time of restitution of what is to happen before Jesus Christ comes back. And you can read that in the book of Acts chapter 3. A lot of prophecy content of the Old Testament prophets has to do with the Eastern Antichrist. <laughs> and yet most Christians don't know there is such a thing as Eastern Antichrist. In fact, a lot of, we'll say, dispensationalist, futurist type of interpreters, they've just got everything that they can see bad. That must be about the final Antichrist or, you know, the end times. That's it. And that's all. And it's a very, um, you can get into, like, for example, it's hyper dispensationalists. And in fact, those that say that parts of the gospel or parts of scripture are only relevant to one or other groups of people. Um, for example, the late, you know, mid-Acts and late-Acts and those people that, that say um, only what Paul wrote is relevant to the churches um, of today and that's all. No, that's, we're completely going against that view because we're saying all the scripture, including all the Old Testament, um, is relevant to us. So in this way, those with a um, with sort of a more covenant theology type of approach um, a bit, uh, better advanced on the right track because at least they're seeing the relevance in a spiritual sense of the Old Testament for the Christians today uh, as well. Um, the book of Acts prophesies or has prophecies which are related to this. Um, the outpouring of the Spirit for example, in Acts chapter 2, the church restitution, Acts chapter 3, and the Gentiles' conversion in Acts chapter 28, where Paul says they will hear it. Now, this is really, really great because that's relevant to what? Eastern Antichrist. So if you've got a viewpoint that says um, there's this age of grace, so basically John the Apostle dies, there's this age of grace of where basically Paul's doctrines are the norm, and then one day there's going to be a rapture and then there's all this other thing that happened in the tribulation, whatever. And, and that's your sort of very narrow point of view. 
then you're not really understanding that there is an Eastern Antichrist or anything to do with the lineage or the iterations of fulfillment of Eastern Antichrist. And you don't really have a place for things like the outpouring of the Spirit other than what you see in the book of Acts literally happening. And then you'll say, well, that was for the Jews, really, um, and only at the start of the church. Um, or church restitution, because that whole chapter would just be irrelevant to you. Well, at least, at least the post-millennialists, even though they're wrong to think that Christ is not coming to take away his church, um, at least the post-millennials have a positive view about a kind of a church restitution aspect of, well, the gospel should have progress in history. The Great Commission should actually be fulfilled, you know. Um, and as for the Gentiles' conversion, that's a massive promise of Scripture throughout, as we know, actually. I mean, you don't have to read the book of Romans where he says, Lord, him all your people, and, and so on and so on. Um, where it talks about there shall be a root of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign of the Gentiles and him shall the Gentiles trust. Many, many scriptures throughout uh, the book of Isaiah alone has many of these prophecies. So here we see a whole opening up of understanding of relevance to scripture. So what we're really talking about here is how to interpret the Bible properly. And with that, you need a proper schema, a proper method of understanding both literally and then um, spiritually. So, for example, the first literally prophecies leading up to the coming of the Assyrians and what blessings shall follow is how you would read the book of Isaiah, like Isaiah talking in his time. However, more importantly and ultimately, there's something called the anagogical interpretation. Now, um, I guess I'm defining anagogical in, in that it's potentially spiritual, but it means ultimate or its ultimate relevance to us in its ultimate form. That's what I mean by anagogical, not merely to be re relegated to our future beyond this lifetime, as in, you know, in the time to come, but as in its ultimate earth period, present time fulfillment, as Jesus even said about, you know, if you've given up things for the gospel's sake, you'll have a manifold of the of that same those same things now in this time. So, so we're talking about the relevance of Scripture in these times of history, not in some other future time of history. In other words, it's relevant to us that there should be um, the day of visitation is a here and now day of visitation, not a day of visitation one day off in the in the blue yonder of the uh, you know ten thousand years of of singing God's praise. Um, so we're talking essentially about divine intervention and divine design in history. So this, the anagogical, that is, that the Assyrians are type of anti, uh, Eastern Antichrist, which is actually correct, um, and the ultimate a Eastern Antichrist in, in its present form is Gog, although actually you can see that the actual ultimate <laughs> Eastern Antichrist in its final Oh, and truly anagogical form actually is Satan leading a rebellion at the end of the millennium. However, um, in in our history, in our time frame, it's Gog, which hasn't happened yet, by the way. Um, and Hezekiah's blessing is a picture of the latter days glory of the saints, great outpouring and church restitution that obviously follows the fall of Gog. You read Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, you'll see that it says about God's pouring out of his spirit, etc., you can match it up with Joel, Joel. You can match it up with um, all kinds of things. Um, so essentially, those Christians historically that believed in latter days glory of the saints, uh, that believed that yes, before Christ returns, there should be victories for the church, and and those Pentecostals that believe in great outpouring, and and that doctrine that basically um, church doctrine, church unity, and everything should increase. Knowledge shall be increased before the end um, and and paid all the things paid back that have been stolen from the church, that's church restitution doctrine, um, that all of that together is this view and in a proper sense, which is actually word and spirit doctrine. Okay, so that's how we would un understand and read the book of Isaiah. And besides having literal relevance to Isaiah's day, there are also prof prophecies which primarily focus on Cyrus, well, that's a literal prophecy, because even though it's in, we'll say, prophetic and symbolical language, 
you know, about the, the two leaved gates and things like that. Um, that literally happened with King Cyrus. There really was a king called King Cyrus who really did come and conquer Babylon, who really did come to the gates under the city of Babylon and really did find those gates open and really did go in through the river, river into the um, area of Babylon and take it over in one night, in fact. Uh, we see prophecy about John the Baptist. We know about um, that's quoted and referred to in the New Testament. Um, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, we're told. Um, Jesus Christ is prophesied in the book of Isaiah. For example, Isaiah 53 is prophecy, but there's other prophecies about the root of Jesse and so on. And of course, prophecies about the millennium. <coughs> Excuse me. We find that in um, Isaiah chapter 9, 10, 11, um, and 63, 64, 65, 66, um, in sort of those areas. I'm not giving specifics, but... But I'm saying earlier and later in Isaiah, there is references you can find in some of those chapters I mentioned, um, indication to the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, so that that's in there. All right. And, and literally so, for example, that the lion should eat straw like the ox or a bullock um, is clearly a literal prophecy, and yet it's future. So if that's literally true in the future, then... Um, was there any spiritual or other or symbolical or some other meaning that had already come to pass? Uh, usually we're saying like literal first and then spiritual second. Now the spiritualized of course means that it applies in the New Testament in that sense, not that it's necessarily um, allegorical, typological or, or spiritual in, in that sense. In other words, there literally will be a time when lions do eat grass or straw. Um, you know, uh, so that's, that's a literal prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. So the destruction of the Assyrians indicates the destruction of Gog, which strictly speaking is more than allegory typology or spiritual in that the destruction of Gog itself is literal, hence the appropriate or appropriated term anagogical. In other words, one literal event, i.e. the angels striking the, the armies of the Assyrians because they went to Lachish, um, that literally their intention was, and, and they were going to take over Jerusalem. So that literally happening to them is, um, is like a picture of, yes, the fact of a literal striking against Gog doing a similar thing in the future. And so when we say the future now, I'm not talking about the far away future, but sort of our real time world experience coming up in history imminently future as in our normal time frame future not some different era of history future okay so we can get you know more understanding of the book of isaiah that way now uh, the prophecy of cyrus john the baptist and the millennium at least also have spiritual fulfillments for the latter days being um so this prophecy about cyrus building jerusalem it says that in isaiah 44 uh, building Jerusalem, that talks about church conformity, unity of the brethren, you know, um, church love and fellowship, church unity. Um, and laying the temple foundation, uh, that is a sign or picture of proper doctrine or the word of God being laid down and understood. So therefore, Cyrus literally is also then symbolical of what should happen in the latter days church. Uh, the making of the crooked path straight, etc. Um, not only is a prophecy about John the Baptist, obviously John the Baptist didn't really use, you know, shovels and made, <laughs> oh, I've got to make these paths straight and whatever, but rather that was symbolical about um, what his message was about when he was baptizing in Jordan, etc. However, um, that spirit that he was of, which we're told in the New Testament what spirit he's of, is the spirit of Elijah. And that spirit that John the Baptist is like a coming of Elijah in one sense, is not the only coming of Elijah, because we told in Malachi that Elijah comes uh, to turn the hearts of children to the father and fathers to the children. Uh, we're told that, which means that this making of the crooked path straight and, you know, high places um, being brought low essentially and, and, and all that kind of thing, that that um, prophecy in Isaiah is really also in a spiritual sense talking about an elijah church movement so you can see then there's a 
a word and spirit movement in the church to to fulfill these things as well or in other words the church itself prior to the coming of christ for the church is like an elijah in relation to the coming of christ or uh, relating to um as as elijah is to elisha or john the baptist is to jesus um in that way um the church in the latter days to the actual millennial reign of christ so then you have to have a spiritual millennium before the literal millennium and that's the latter days glory of the saints or the church in blessing today so the wolf with the lamb prophecy um means blessings for the church restitution prior to the church the return of christ for the church in other words a reversal of the curse um in a spiritual sense so things like healings outpouring the spirit and all kinds of um, financial uh, reversals and blessings for the people of God, that indeed must be symbolized by these things, including the enemies, the wolf, um, with the lamb. So there must be a pacification of that attack on Christianity. Well, at the moment, you don't see that whatsoever. So therefore, it's something imminently that must be fulfilled rather than um, that it's come to pass as yet in this form. We know therefore, to expect that. In this way, scripture, for example, the book of Isaiah, no longer is merely locked in the past. And this is really an unbelieving approach that people have. And they talk about Isaiah lived in these years, and he was saying that, I'm talking about evangelical believing, you know, whether they're Calvinists or whatever in the Bible colleges of various sorts, they talk like, you know, oh, he was prophesying about Christ, and which is true, not denying any of that. But it's like it's all locked in the past. Oh, it was wonderful, you know, Isaiah being opened up by Spurgeon or, or Calvin or some people in the past. Oh, the wonderful truth that it had. <laughs> but you see, that's, that's not enough. Or this idea, well, he's talking about a future time of blessing, you know, will be in the, in the sweet by and by. Well, again... The book of Isaiah, as the scripture is written for us, for our learning, for us today, much of it must be relevant for us. Therefore, and, and thus, things like the, the coming and defeat of Eastern Antichrist, the church in blessing, must all be things where the book of Isaiah is most relevant for, which we haven't really seen yet, but that's what we must lay hold of. And that's how you will read the Bible, and that's how you would find... Oh, there's so much in the book of Isaiah that's so relevant and full of life and full of meaning and full of import for us today. Um, it's a complete different approach than this, you know, locked into the past, locked into Isaiah's are. Oh, that's how the, you know, Near Eastern, you know, Jewish people sort of viewed it or whatever. No, no, we're talking about what does it mean for Christians now? Okay, so nor is it deferred off into the future, um, but is relevant and specific to us today or to our time, to, to where the church is at and what it's doing. So it's prophetic in for the church in history. That's an overview of how to understand and interpret the Bible. I hope that you got something out of that, and I believe that uh, you'll be blessed as you look at my website, bibleprotector.com. God bless you.